In addition, uh, from a CD4 count standpoint, uh, we want to raise their level to above the baseline as to which they came in. And from a viral load standpoint, that their uh, viral load should be undetectable, um, which means less than 400 copies per ml by six months of uh, having been on treatment. So what are the effects of ART? Uh, it's what you would expect effects of ART to be in an adult as well. So from a viral standpoint, you want to reduce the ability of the virus to replicate. Um, from an immune system standpoint, you want to reduce uh, and reverse the damage uh, that the HIV has done to the child's uh, immune system. And then just other things, you want to decrease their chance of, of, of having an opportunistic infection, uh, of uh, developing a cancer secondary, secondary to their HIV. You want to make sure that they're growing well and developing well as well, uh, improving their quality of life, and then prolonging their survival. So uh, once you are on ART, if you're a child, you need to uh, monitor the effectiveness of treatment. So clinically, you need to monitor, be monitoring the child for signs and symptoms of progression of their disease. So can you guys think of any things that you might look for if you're looking for progression of their HIV? Losing weight, great. Any other things? So you can think about it as any things that you, they might have uh, come in with at first. So thrush, big lymph nodes, losing weight, not developing right, tuberculosis, those kinds of things. So the same uh, types of symptoms you would be worried about when you're first seeing a child um, in terms of them having HIV. From a laboratory standpoint, you want to be monitoring their viral load and their CD4 cell count as well. Um, in addition, adherence is very important uh, in children as well. Unlike in adults, uh, adherence, especially in young children, is really uh, mediated by their caregiver. So it's really making sure that the caregiver is plugged in uh, to make sure that the child's uh, taking their uh, medications. Disclosure is a big issue in children. Uh, you know, you ask the question, well, when is the right time to tell a child that they're HIV positive? And that really depends on a lot of things. And I think it sounds like there's going to be an additional lecture just on disclosure, and we'll be, uh, Brian will be covering that as well. You want to be monitoring for toxicity or side effects of the medication. Uh, the medications we have nowadays for children are very good, but unfortunately some of them have some uh, pretty obvious side effects that you want to be monitoring for over time. So peripheral neuropathy, it basically means that you have either tinkling or loss of sensation in your extremities. Lactic acidosis is a type of acidosis that you can develop secondary to some of the medications. Lipodystrophy, have you guys ever seen lipodystrophy? What, so what is that? What does it look like? So it's a change in fat distribution. So they kind of have a very uh, in the center and wasted in the extremities. And then anemia as well. So let's talk about the guidelines, the South African guidelines that just were, um, actually before that, we're going to talk about identifying patients. Uh, so uh, you can think about identifying patients uh, according to different categories. So the first one is the child is symptomatic. So we already talked about some of the symptoms that a child could be having um, if they are HIV infected. That being said, there are a lot of children that are actually asymptomatic. There's new literature that's coming out that talks about adolescents who were infected at the time of birth living until their teens, uh, maybe not doing 100% well, but surviving. So there are some patients that you need to think about uh, as being asymptomatic, but still being infected with their HIV. So how do you pick up patients who are asymptomatic? So first thing, you know, maybe they're seeing a doctor and they might be concerned because there is a history of mom being HIV positive, so you want to test the baby. And the other thing that's actually not part of the recommendations here in South Africa is opt-out testing. And what's opt-out testing? So you offer testing to everyone when they walk in uh, to, the, uh, to your clinic or into your VCT clinic. Um, and they have a right to refuse, but you offer everyone testing. Um, this is not part of the, of the guidelines yet the, um, to include children in this kind of testing procedure, though uh, for adults and adolescents in South Africa, it's now standard of care to uh, provide opt-out testing in that group. Uh, in addition to that, uh, especially if a child comes with a history of mom being HIV positive, those babies are known as HIV exposed. So those babies are already at a higher risk, um, not only for developing HIV, for, but for overall having poor health. Like, for example, more pneumonia, uh, more difficulty growing. So in those HIV exposed babies, uh, we check DNA PCRs at six weeks. 
And then if a baby is being breastfed by a, by a mother or someone who's uh, HIV infected, you want to check their PCR again six weeks after they stop breastfeeding. And that's very important to not only ask, you know, did, uh, was mom breastfeeding the baby, but is, was someone else breastfeeding the baby as well. And if they're older than 18 months, you do an ELISA on them. Okay. So just to highlight that, you know, it's really important to ask, is the baby breastfeeding? Because if you do an ELISA today and the baby is still breastfeeding for an additional year, the ELISA today might be negative, but we know that a good amount, like uh, 25, 30% of infections that happen in kids happen during the breastfeeding period. So that's very important uh, to remember. So what symptoms are concerning for HIV? We're going to go into these uh, into a little bit more uh, detail. So uh, patients who have symptoms, you know, the, the list is huge, as you can see. So just walking through big ones, weight loss or poor development, fever that's unexplained, you look for a reason and no, no, they keep having fever, big lymph nodes, uh, a big liver or spleen going along with like inflammation in these big lymph nodes, uh, recurrent infections, how to be viral infections, bacterial infections, um, any other opportunistic infection. Thrush is a big one we see in kids. The big parotid glands. Um, having a persistent cough or diarrhea. Um, TB. Uh, pneumocystis carinii PCP is a big one, especially in the very young, uh, under one year age group. Um, and then we talked about um, loss of uh, milestones of developmental delay. So a child who's not developing, like, you know, it's not talking when they should, it's not walking when they should. You should think about that. So what are some of the symptoms that are even more red flags uh, for HIV in a child? So PCP is a big one, especially, like I said, in the younger age group. Uh, candidiasis, you know, sometimes babies will get thrush anyways because they're babies and their immune system uh, is still developing. But once you have an older baby with thrush, or even if it, it actually involves their esophagus, that would be very concerning. Um, LIP, or lymphocytic interst interstitial pneumonitis, does anyone know what that is? Okay, so this is something that's actually pretty particular to children with HIV. And it's basically, uh, you get a chest x-ray on the child and it looks like there is extra <coughs> stuff there, like an infiltrate. And sometimes people will confuse it for tuberculosis. But it's uh, something that we see in kids, and it's something that's thought to be mediated by uh, a virus called EBV, or Epstein-Barr virus. And it's something that uh, we all as adults, more than uh, likely than not, have seen this uh, virus. But um, kids, because as they're still developing their immune system, might come across it the first time or the second time or something like that, they develop different symptoms than as adults uh, we would. Um, Zoster. Does anyone know what uh, herpes zoster is? Shingles. So it's the like same thing as shingles. So a child with shingles should be a really red, high red flag that maybe the child might be HIV infected. That's not something that we see very often in children. Uh, invasive salmonella, like when you get salmonella in your bloodstream, uh, you can get salmonella like dysentery from salmonella, but when it actually gets into their blood, that would be a very big red flag. Kaposi sarcoma. Uh, you guys familiar with that? So uh, also would be a red flag. Lymphoma as well, which is something else you can see in adults. And then fistula, a rectovaginal fistula, or fistula between your rectum and your uh, vagina. Questions about that? Great. So let's talk about identifying patients and uh, opt-out testing. So like we said, even though these are not part of the uh, recommendations from the Republic of South Africa guidelines, uh, this should be something that you should really be thinking about and trying to incorporate in your practice. And the reason is, is that you would think, well, if you have a PMTCT program that's working really well, there shouldn't be that many kids that are infected. Unfortunately, although a lot of places do have good PMTCT programs, over time, a lot of those women do not get the best follow-up. So there are still a good number of children who are being infected at the time of birth or during the breastfeeding period. So in particular, uh, the figures out of uh, this area is that 40% of pregnant women are positive. Without any intervention, um, 45%, even maybe 60, 66% of moms will transmit the virus to their baby. Uh, with no uh, antiretrovirus for the mom or no prophylaxis for the mom or the baby. So sometimes you'd be like, well, the woman got an HIV test. That's great. But the next question is, well, did the woman get the care that she needed? Did she get antiretrovirals? Did she, did she get prophylaxis at the time of birth? 
and then afterwards the baby get prophylaxis for six weeks until a diagnosis was secured for that baby. So need to remember that the PMTCT program as it is now uh, is not catching all the children. So you should really consider opt-out testing um, when you see a child. Okay. So pediatric disclosure uh, is something, like I said, that's very complicated in children, um, but it's very important to uh, address as well. And the reason that it's a little bit more complicated in, in children is that you have to figure out where they are developmentally. You know, you, you know, telling a three-year-old is usually not something that you would do, but you know, when do you decide? Do you tell an eight-year-old? Do you tell a 12-year-old? It really depends on how they are developing and what they're able to understand. Assessing their social support. Sometimes, a lot of times, the parents aren't ready or the primary caretaker is not ready to tell that child uh, that they're HIV positive. Um, never lie uh, if a child does ask you the question. And then making sure that you, you get the caretaker and parent comfortable with the issues around disclosure. So every time you see that parent or caretaker, be like, bring it up. You know, have you thought about this? You know, have you thought about how you would do it? Who else have you looked to and asked questions about for support in, do it, uh, in disclosing to your child? So we're gonna talk about assessing eligibility. So uh, assessing eligibility in children is very comprehensive. It, it, it um, encompasses clinical things, immunological things, and social criteria as well. So um, how do you, first of all, diagnose a child um, with HIV, and how do you uh, figure out whether they're eligible for antiretrovirals? The first thing, you need to confirm their HIV diagnosis. So that means different things in different age groups. Um, and under 18 months old, 18 month olds, how do you confirm an HIV diagnosis? What test? PCR. PCR. When they're older than 18 months, how, what test do you use? Yeah. ELISA or the rapid test is also a good test. Um, so you need to confirm your diagnosis first. Uh, once you have confirmed your diagnosis, you need to ask the question, has this uh, child been, uh, had many hospitalizations and specifically more than two in the last year? You should next ask yourself, if the child was hospitalized, were they hospitalized for a very long period of time, so more than four weeks? And then um, you need to uh, go through and ask, whoops, uh, ask if they have any other clinical, uh, clinical criteria. So I'm going to stop there and say that this is very important because this is uh, the new South African guidelines that came out in April. So unlike before, uh, the new recommendation is that all children under one year of age who have the diagnosis of HIV should be started on treatment. It doesn't matter how good they look, how good their CD4 count is, how good their viral load is, doesn't matter. Even if they are a picture of health, they need ARVs. And the reason is that we know that in very young babies, their progression of disease can be very rapid. So they can go from being healthy to not healthy very quickly. And it's a little bit unpredictable. You can't be like, well, their CD4 count was really good, so they shouldn't get sick. It doesn't really hold in babies so much. They found uh, in a study actually out of South Africa that when you treat all babies, not asking like what is going on with them, but start them on antiretrovirals, you can reduce 77% uh, chance of dying in the first year of life, and like 70% chance of other things going on, like opportunistic infections uh, or other bad outcomes. So this is very important, okay? Um, the criteria for the other age groups hasn't changed that much. So from the one to five age group, uh, you're gonna look at uh, whether they're having symptoms, and we'll, we'll go through and talk about how you categorize based on the WHO uh, criteria, whether a child is stage three or stage four. Uh, also asking what is their CD4 percentage, so less than 25% is concerning, or uh, absolute value less than 750. In the older age group, uh, greater than five years, um, once again, symptoms, stage three or, uh, or four, and then having a CD4 count less than 15% or absolute less than 350. Okay, questions about that. This is very important, especially for the babies. Okay. So uh, going along with the new uh, South African guidelines, uh, now uh, they're recommending to fast track patients. So fast tracking to starting ARVs. So the patients that would qualify for fast tracking um, starting ARVs are all children less than one year of age, right? Um, anyone who has severe clinical manifestations, so a stage four child, or anyone that has uh, resistant tuberculosis, okay? And what does it mean to fast track? You are aiming to start antiretrovirals within two weeks. Okay, so very quickly. 
So do not wait for LFTs, do not wait for baseline labs. Really, it's important to start within two weeks. Questions about that? All right, so now we're gonna talk about how you stage a child from a clinical standpoint. And these are uh, staging criteria that comes from the WHO. So stage one, not surprisingly, is an asymptomatic child or a child who has um, lymphadenopathy or big lymph nodes uh, or enlarged glands. Um, where do you guys look for enlarged glands in a child or in anyone? So the neck, where else would you look? The armpits, anywhere else? In the groin, great. So those are all things that uh, would be important to check in a child. Let's talk about stage two, and I broke it down by system. So ear, nose, and throat uh, is the first one. So any recurrent oral ulcers. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen linear gingival erythema, but basically they get like a line right next to like right above their teeth at the beginning of their gums. Um, angular chelitis is when you get some breakdown right here. Like sometimes you'll see in kids who have had really chapped lips, but if a kid has persistent breakdown in the corners of their mouth, um, something that would be concerning. Parotid enlargement, do you guys know where your parotid sit? So back here, it's kind of what the same area that affects you when you have mumps, okay? Uh, the second thing is recurrent respiratory tract infections or anything in your respiratory tree, um, including recurrent, uh, which is not really part of your respiratory tree, but part of uh, that system uh, would be recurrent ear infections. Otitis me is a fancy word for that. Um, a chronic ear infection would be concerning. And kids who have recurrent sinusitis or infection of their sinuses. Okay? Going on with stage two children, so what would you look for on their skin? Um, papular pruritic eruptions. Has, has anyone seen that before? Raise a hand of who's seen that before? In a child? Great. And what does that look like for those that have seen it? Yeah, so it kind of looks like they have like all these little bumps and they're itching and like they're having a lot of symptoms from it. Um, there's something that goes along with HIV and something, uh, once again, that I think about more in a child rather than an adult. Um, molluscum contagiosum, who of you have seen that? Great. What does that look like? They almost look like little warts. People talk about they look like a little, like a wart with a little central divot, like a little crater in the middle especially if you see them in children that have a lot of them on their face, that's for some reason particularly concerning, okay? We talked about zoster shingles already. Um, from a gastrointestinal standpoint, hepatosplenomegaly, that's a fancy word for a big liver and a big spleen, okay? And feeling here and feeling down here for that. All right, we are transitioning now to stage three. So remember, stage three would be a criteria to, uh, to start a child on ARVs. So what would you look for? Uh, persistent fevers, especially if they have no explanation, um, who, that have been on and off or consistent for a month. Uh, malnutrition. From an ear, nose, and throat standpoint, thrush, especially thrush in an older kid. Um, oral hairy leukoplakia, who's seen that? Who's seen a picture of that? It's that like you get these like patches on your tongue. So you have them stick out their little tongue and they have like these patches, okay? Painful? Uh, they're not painful, no. Um, next, acute necrotizing ulcerative gingiv uh, gingivitis. Fancy word for like just really inflamed uh, abnormal gums, okay? From a gastrointestinal standpoint, persistent diarrhea more than 14 days. Um, from a respiratory standpoint, um, TB in your lungs, or not a respiratory standpoint, but I include in the wrong section, TB like in your glands, so you get like a big gland that's uh, thought to be TB. Um, recurrent pneumonia, uh, chronic lung disease or bronchiectasis. Uh, basically, that means that uh, you look at their chest x-ray because the child's symptomatic, they're breathing fast, and there's particular types of changes um, where uh, it makes you think that maybe that there's been chronic damage to the lungs. Okay, that's something that the uh, physician would help you with. And LIP is what we talked about earlier. Does anyone remember what that is? Yeah, keep going. That's a good job. <coughs> so lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis. And you guys remember the virus that it's associated with? EBV, great. Uh, next, from a hematology standpoint, uh, HIV affects a child's bone marrow, so they could be anemic. Uh, they can have a neutropenia, or uh, one particular type of white blood cell might be particularly low, and this puts them at risk for uh, certain types of infections. And then thrombocytopenia is a fancy word for saying low platelets, 
Okay, so these are like three major lines that your bone marrow would make. They're all affected. All right, stage four disease. So once again, this would be a reason to start a child on antiretrovirals. So severe wasting, recurrent infections that are severe. So meningitis, does everyone know what that is? Great. Empyema, who's seen that? So it's basically a collection of pus sitting between your lung and your chest wall. Okay, so that it could be secondary to a pneumonia that's gotten complicated uh, is usually what happens. Okay, that's usually bad. The child's pretty sick. They're breathing fast. Pyomyositis, who's seen that? So myositis means muscle. So pyomyositis is an infection, like a bacterial infection of your muscle. So sometimes the children will come in with a red thigh. Sometimes it'll drain, but it'll be very tender to touch. And the child will usually be sick. Fever, a high white count when, on the full blood count, those kinds of things. Uh, chronic HSVs or chronic herpes. Um, that could be, um, you know, because they have like, you know, a lot of herpes infections in their mouth. So little children sometimes get herpes uh, in their mouth. Um, you, could, you can get herpes meningitis. Uh, it could be a different types of manifestations. Uh, CMV, is everyone familiar with CMV? Uh, CMV is uh, cytomegalovirus. It's a virus that once again, once you get to adulthood, most of us have, have uh, come across and been infected with. But as a child, once again, because usually their immune system is naive or hasn't seen many of these infections, uh, will have sometimes problems fighting, especially if their immune system is not normal from their HIV. Okay? Um, and that can affect all kinds of things. It can affect your bone marrow. It can affect your liver. Um, and it's particularly dangerous in small babies. Uh, extra pulmonary TB. So what are other, where are other places that TB goes to? Bones, brain. Abdomen, sure. Like it goes, a lot. it can go anywhere basically, uh, but the ones that you mentioned are the most common. Um, disseminated non-tuberculosis mycobacterial infection. Do you guys know like what that what that means? So you guys can think about maybe like a kid who's gotten BCG, and the BCG causes disease, like either like a big lymph node, or people who have lymph nodes from other types of tuberculosis, because tuberculosis uh, is one agent. And there's all these other bacteria that are in the same family, but are, are non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And these are things that live in the soil, things that are, we just come across. So it can cause a big lymph node. It can cause chronic skin infections. And in a child who's been uh, very sick or has an unwell immune system can get into their blood. So how many of you guys have heard of like MAC or MAI? No, uh, it's my, uh, mycobacterial avium complex. Uh, it's something that can go to your bone marrow. It's actually one of the, one of the more common ones that we see uh, in this category. Uh, from a respiratory standpoint, PCP. Uh, we talked about candida, uh, so uh, thrush. Basically, it's gone down to your trachea or into your lungs. So that's a fungal infection. Um, esophageal candidiasis, so thrush basically in your esophagus. Um, getting a fungal infection, like for example, in your blood or your lungs, that would also be very concerning or cryptococcosis um, outside of your lungs. So it can go to your brain. It would be one of the major places it can go. So cryptococcus. Okay. Questions about that? Oh, we keep going. So other things, uh, diagnoses. From an oncology standpoint, Kaposi sarcoma. From a, a heart standpoint, um, you can have cardiomyopathy or an abnormal heart. You know, your heart can get big and floppy and it you know, might not contract right. Uh, from your kidney standpoint, you might have uh, changes in your kidney. It might, uh, HIV might affect your kidney. Uh, from your gastrointestinal standpoint, you can get diarrhea secondary to these two guys that are mentioned here, cryptosporidium or isospora. It causes chronic diarrhea. Um, you can get fistulas that we talked about before. Uh, from your brain standpoint, lymphoma, toxoplasmosis. Um, you can actually just get uh, encephalopathy directly from the HIV. So these are children that are not developing right, and that's why it's really important to ask that question. Or PML, fancy name is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. That's something that I've never seen in a child. It's something that I think about more in adult, but uh, would be something to worry about. And basically, uh, the children get abnormalities in their brain. They start losing milestones, um, and it's thought to be associated with a virus. Okay, questions about that? That's a lot to take in, so just kind of um, wanted to just go through that. Okay, so the next thing, so we've talked about some of the uh, immunologic, so the lab tests. We've talked about the clinical things. Now we're going to talk about the social criteria about starting uh, antiretrovirals. 
So you need to think about the fact that adherence needs to be at least probable when you recommend that someone should start antiretrovirals. So you need to make sure that they have at least one identifiable uh, adult caretaker uh, that can help them with their medications. You need to make sure that that adult taking care of that child is reliable. Um, and you need to encourage that adult who is the primary caretaker to disclose to someone else in the home or a close friend, because if that adult is not there, the other adult can step up and help that child take their medications and always have a backup plan. So, you know, what is going to happen if the primary caretaker has to go away for work or they run out of medication? So thinking, thinking about, you know, how you would address those things. Some additional things uh, to consider, and they're also very important, uh, making sure you ask the caretaker how their health is. Um, and make sure that, uh, especially if you're seeing a child with HIV, uh, that you know, chances are that their mother is going to be positive. So making sure that the mother's health overall is well, um, not only you know, asking her, but asking her, you know, what was your last CD4 count? Um, those kinds of things. We know that in mothers who have low CD4 counts, their ch children have a two and a half time risk of dying. And if mothers who actually pass away um, and the, the child's being taken care of someone, by someone else, the child has a three times chance of dying compared to other children. So that's very important. Uh, and it's always nice, if possible, to have what we call family-centered care. So, you know, if the mother and the child are positive, can they be seen in the same clinic um, and get their care um, all in one place? Okay. Um, okay, so from a family standpoint, um, things that the parents and care caregivers and if the child's older must understand is that Treatment needs to happen every day. It's something that, you know, can't do it every other day when I want to. It's every day. Um, that ARTs, once you start them, are lifelong. Um, and get, giving them a sense of what the prognosis of HIV is in children, as well as the side effects they might come across so they can be aware of those um, when their child is getting that medication. So what happens if you go through this list and the child's not eligible? So you need to still provide care for that child. They might not be on antiretrovirals, but they still need comprehensive care. So in the child who is not on antiretrovirals, you should be assessing their growth. So how tall they are, how their head is growing, how they're gaining weight, making sure that they get their appropriate immunizations, making sure that they're on the correct medications. So uh, cotrimoxazole or Bactrim prophylaxis is extremely important, not only in preventing PCP, but it's also been associated with decreased bouts of diarrhea, uh, lung infections as well. So it's a very important thing to provide to a child. Um, making sure they've gotten their vit vitamin A supplementation and their deworming medications as well. Um, and placing them on a multivitamin. And uh, it's nice in that the multivitamin, because it is every day, it's a way of practicing adherence when a child is eligible for antiretrovirals. You should see that child every three months and do a clinical uh, staging on them, so assessing them clinically. And then every six months, they should get labs. Okay, questions about that? Great, so let's go back and talk about the patient who is eligible for antiretrovirals. So what is the process for initiating antiretrovirals in a child? So the first visit um, usually uh, is two to four weeks act before actually starting antiretrovirals. You need to, number one, name the responsible caregiver. So who is going to be the primary caretaker? Number two, start talking about adherence. You know, it's never too early to really, like, make sure that they understand the importance of that. Start explaining the side effects of antiretrovirals, because even though I said these medications are great, they are not free of side effects. Um, and then start talking about exactly, like, what it's going to mean to get them. You know, your child's going to need to take medications two times per day, so in the morning and at night, you know, or your child's going to need to take medication, you know, once a day. So giving them ideas to what they're in for. And then getting baseline labs for the child. So this includes CD4 counts, a viral load, and some baseline uh, labs as well. So um, in addition, you're going to assess them clinically as well. So you, when you see the child, you're going to see how they're growing. So you're going to put them on a growth curve. How many of you guys have seen a growth curve before in children? Raise your hands. So not so many of you. So basically, it's a way of, of um, you get a weight on a child. I have a little child with me. I ha they weigh 10 kilos, and they are four years old. So that's very small for a four-year-old, a four right? 
Um, how would you know that? Maybe like if you worked with children a lot, you would be like, that child's really skinny, uh, really thin. The other way is that they have these curves where you can follow a, a child's uh, growth, what should be normal growth over time. So you look at their age and you put it on the little graph. And it tells you how small they are compared to other children. Okay, so that's very important. You want to calculate body surface area cause, because some of the medications that we use, the antiretrovirals, are dosed based on body surface area. And that's basically a, a formula that takes into account their weight and their height. You want to exclude tuberculosis because that would be uh, something uh, to worry about if you're starting. Uh, if you have tuberculosis, to start antiretrovirals right away. So what are some of the symptoms of tuberculosis? Without reading, what are some of the symptoms? Great. How about if you get a chest film? What, what might you see? If you get a chest film, a radiograph. What do you see if you get a chest x-ray on the child? Maybe if they have tuberculosis. You can see extra, extra stuff in there. You can see big holes. Or you can see nothing. Sometimes children don't have anything. But uh, some of these other symptoms would clue you into that. Um, a mantu, how many of you guys are familiar with that? You put a little bubble on their, their skin and see if they have a reaction. Okay, um, and then getting an abdominal ultrasound to see if they have involvement of any of the other organs, the liver. Okay. All right, visit two. Um, you're going to once again assess the child clinically. All right, and then it's important to continue the education for the caretaker because, like I said, if it, the child's not going to do it on their own, they need the support of their caretaker to uh, help them with this. Um, you want to once again address adherence. And for patients who are not going to stay in your center, you want to provide them with a very detailed letter uh, saying, like, you know, what their lab results were, what you thought about the child's clinical assessment, and what your recommendations are. Okay. Uh, so uh, next visit, we're up to visit number three. So that's when you initiate uh, therapy. So you once again want to look at the child clinically, plot them on their growth curve, get a body surface area. You want to make sure you've looked at the results of the labs that you drew two weeks prior. Once again, you want to review adherence. Um, and then going into detail about what the drug regimen is going to be and the side effects of the regimen so they, the parents know what to look for, the caretakers know what to good, look for. Um, at this point, you're going to start your uh, antiretrovirals and give them a two-week supply. And a call should be placed to the family one week into uh, therapy to make sure everything's going, up, uh, going well. All right. So this is also very important. These are the new recommendations uh, that came out in April uh, for recommended uh, treatment regimens in children. Uh, I'm going to highlight the major changes. Uh, so under three-year-olds, oh, under three-year-olds, the big difference is the back of ear. And in the older three-year-olds, the big difference is the back of ear. Do, do any of you guys know what medication was in its place before? So it was DDI before, okay? Um, or stabudine. Now it's been replaced by abacavir. Okay? Um, can you guys think of why that might have been the recommendation? So do you, what side effects are associated with stabudine? Great. So it comes with a lot of side effects. Lactic acidosis, lipodystrophy, those kinds of things. So abacavir is, is associated with fewer side effects. So abacavir, uh, 3TC hasn't changed. So abacavir and 3TC or lamivudine are your backbone, right? Your NRTI backbone. Kaletra, how many of you guys are familiar with that? Okay, what kind of medication is that? It's protease inhibitor. Great. Um, so the only difference in this younger age group is the abacavir. How about looking at the older kids? Um, so what is your backbone, your NRTI backbone here in this in this? I don't hear anything. What are your two medications that are your backbone? Yeah, so it's abacavir and lamivudine are your NRTIs. What kind of medications is ephedrine? Super. So you're always going to have, usually, for the most part, you have two, N two, N two NRTIs and something else, either a protease inhibitor or an NNRTI, okay? Uh, second, second line treatment, you guys can look at yourselves. And then just remembering that children who, are, who have tuberculosis or, being, or, being, or are being treated for tuberculosis, um, you need to do things a little bit differently. So in these kids, um, uh, we still use stavudine, lamivudine. 
So, and then uh, Kalitra. So what's your backbone here, your NRTI backbone? Great. And then what's this? Your PI, great. And then same thing for that. Okay. So you might be asking yourself, well, what if a child's already on Stavudine? You know, these new recommendations came out. Should we, like, bring all the kids back to the clinic and put them on a back of ear? No. I think it's going to be very hard. So if the child's on Stavudine uh, and they're asymptomatic, um, just continue it. But if they do develop any symptoms, so you guys called out some of the symptoms already, lipodystrophy, lactic acidosis, peripheral neuropathy, like the abnormalities like tingling, abnormal sensations in their extremities, then you would change to a back of ear. Okay? Uh, all right. So just some overall things to say about pediatric antiretrovirals. Um, it's, it would be nice if possible to change to tablets or capsules as soon as possible. We're lucky that we have solutions, but sometimes some of these solutions are not, either you have to refrigerate them, or there's other things, um, and they're more difficult to carry around those kinds of things. So if possible, the child can either take a pill or you can crush the pill. It's always nicer. Okay, so let me go back to this. So what if uh, a child develops um, side effects from this medication? Would you go here next and be like, oh, this child's having side effects from lamivudine, so I need to go to second line? What do you guys think about that? Yes or no? How many say yes? Okay. How many say no? No, no. A few no's. Okay. So, like, if it's... If it's not true failure, so failure being like, you know, their viral load's getting higher or they're developing new symptoms, those kinds of things, if the child's having side effects from one of the, one of the first-line medications, you just switch it out. So, like, maybe, like, if a child uh, develops some anemia, let's say, to lamivudine, be like, okay, I need to pick another medication. I probably wouldn't have picked AZT but, uh, because that's also associated with anemia, but uh, I'd pick something else. So you don't have to go to second line. You just replace whatever they're having side effects from. Say that again. Yeah. So if there is resistance, the child goes here. But if it's a side effect problem, you can replace one of these. So if they're on a back of the ear and they develop uh, an allergy, you can put AZT instead. So they would be on AZT, lamivudine, and Kalitra. Okay? But if they fail, if there's failure, you would go here. No, like, okay, all right. So that's what this is going, getting to. So it's okay to swap a, dr a drug from first line regimen to a second line due to toxicity or intolerance. Um, the problems with this, even though we do it, is that uh, you might have fewer options when the child actually needs to go to second line. Um, and you would only do this if there's full viral suppression. Okay, the child would have been having a side effect, but otherwise their virus is you know nice and low. Their CD4 count is good as well. Okay, and sometimes it's helpful to ask someone who's done this a lot, like one of the pediatricians. Okay, so some administration tips about giving medications in children. Sometimes they don't like to take them, especially if it tastes bad. So um, just general things, uh, measuring uh, liquids with a syringe. You know, you can give the family a little syringe, a little plastic syringe, and they can wash it out. It lasts a while. And sometimes it helps when the child doesn't want to take the medication. You actually squirt it in the side of their mouth and that way they kind of have to swallow. So you kind of lift this up and squirt it to the side, and they'll swallow it. If you put it down the middle, they'll gag. They'll spit it out. They'll come right back at you. So down to the side. Use whole numbers. So instead of using, like, 3.75 mLs, can a child get away with 3, you know, or, or 4, right? Okay, just make the numbers easier for the family. So what happens if the, if the family forgets to give their child their medication? You give it to them anyways. And then what do you do with the next dose? What if it's like, what if it's noon and you're like, oh yeah, I have to give my kid my medication. Give it at noon and give it at nine if it's due at nine. Okay? Next thing that happens is sometimes child, children will throw up uh, the medication either because they didn't like it or because they're unwell for other reasons. If a child throws up their medication within an hour, you give it again. You redose them. So if they were due for four mLs, you give them another four mLs. If it's been more than an hour, you assume that they probably absorbed some of it. So you leave them alone till the next dose. Okay. All right, let's talk about the medication. So we've talked a little bit about um, 
Dabutine and the fact that it's now not uh, part of the first line in kids uh, in either age group. Um, so Savutin or D4T, it's associated with peripheral neuropathy, and you guys probably know what that is by this point. What is peripheral neuropathy? The tingling or the abnormal sensations or um, ability to feel things. Um, but it's something actually that's seen more in adults. Uh, we worry about it in children, but practically speaking, the people you would see it more commonly in is older people, adolescents and adults. So it's extremely rare in children. Uh, it is associated with lipodystrophy and lactic acidosis. Um, uh, another thing that's not so optimal about it is that uh, the solution form of it needs to be refrigerated. Okay, So to ask the family if they have uh, a refrigerator at home. And it's actually overall pretty well tolerated in children. Uh, so once again, in terms of savutin, what you need to think about it, it needs to be refrigerated. Um, if there's no refrigerator available, uh, you can uh, take the 20 milligram uh, capsules and dissolve them in 20 mLs and then give them, like you know, they're due for 15 milligrams, give them 15 mLs. If they need 10 milligrams, 10 mLs. Okay, so it's a way of just uh, dissolving it. Okay, questions about that? Next medication is Abacavir. So this is a medication that in the past sounds like uh, was not being used that much in children other than children that might be failing their regimen or something like that. So now Abacavir, like we mentioned, is part of the first line in children. The big thing you need to think about in Abacavir, like I said, it's overall a great medication, very well tolerated, but there are a certain percentage of people who have a hypersensitivity reaction, or this is called an allergy to the Abacavir. So how do these children have an allergy? Like how can you tell? So you think, of course, they must have a rash, right? You have an allergy, have a rash. That's not always true with a back of ear. Sometimes they have a rash. Sometimes they don't have a rash. So what other things would you look for? They might just come in unwell, a little fever, um, a little uh, abdominal upset, like throwing up. Um, they might be acting like they might have a flu. Um, and it usually happens uh, six to eight weeks after starting uh, treatment. Okay. So a little bit more about this hypersensitivity reaction or this allergy. Uh, it's thought to occur in 5 to 8% of children. Uh, it's less common in uh, African population. You're like, well, why is that? Uh, it has to do with the fact that this allergy to this medication has to do with uh, your genotype, something called an HLA group. So it, it, um, it would be more common in certain populations of certain ethnic groups than others because it's something that's genetic. Okay? So that's why it's thought to be less common in African populations. Um, if a child does have a hypersensitivity reaction to abacavir, that's it. No more abacavir ever, okay? So you would have to replace abacavir with something else, okay? But you would still leave them on the other medications. And it's important to know that it's something to take pretty seriously and that it can kill a child, kill a person. So lamivudine or 3TC this is a medication you guys are pretty comfortable with. Um, it's actually uh, pretty well tolerated with minimal toxicity. Uh, things that you would worry about are pancreatitis. Um, it's rare, though. Um, and then listed there are reasons that you would stop the 3TC. So if your lipase uh, goes up two and a half times or your LFTs or your liver function tests go up ten times. Um, the nice thing about this medication, uh, it can be cut in half. Uh, so you can the tablets are scored, and the suspension uh, is okay at room temperature. Efavirenz, uh, Restocrine, uh, the big thing that people worry about are CNS side effects, so crazy dreams, hallucinations, those kinds of things. So because of that, uh, sometimes it's best to give the dose at night before bedtime instead of during the day so uh, the child's still able to function. And they actually usually go away, so two, on a two-week uh, interval. It's a medication that's used especially when a child has a, a tuberculosis co-infection. Um, other things that you would need to worry about is that there's a rash associated with efavirenz and nevirapine as well. So how many of you guys have seen a nevirapine rash? Great. How many have, have you, have, have you have seen a efavirenz rash? Okay. So I think there's pictures in here, so we'll get to that. Uh, the big thing to remember is that if a woman is pregnant, they should not get efavirenz. Okay, that would be toxic to the baby. Do you guys know why it's toxic to the baby? What does it do to the baby? Okay, I hear a lot of answers. Someone want to say what it is? Loud and proud? Let me still use it. So what if it's really early on? Do you guys know what kind of side effect it can have on the baby? 
a neural cord. Great. So it's a, it's a called a neural tube closing defect. So basically, when you're developing as a baby and like your spinal cord is developing, things close, and like so you have a closed tube. Uh, Efavirenz is thought to have a side effect that it, it, it inhibits that appropriate closure of that tube. So I don't know if you guys know any children that have like spina bifida or myelomeningocele, like these like abnormalities in their spinal cord and the closure of that. So efavirenz is associated with that in children. That's why it's not recommended in pregnant women because it's toxic to the baby. Okay. Neverapine. Uh, so uh, the important thing to know about neverapine is that you have to adjust the dose uh, after the first two weeks. So at first you give them only the medication once daily, and then after two weeks you go to twice daily. So you need to bring them back and teach them that. Um, this medication requires uh, monitoring your liver function test uh, at two, four, and eight weeks, and then uh, every six months. Side effects, we talked, touched on that a little bit. Uh, neverapine is associated with a rash. Um, it's not that common to see that in children. The population, the pediatric population, you might see that in more commonly is adolescent girls more than in the, in the adults. But for the, from a pediatric standpoint, not so common. But if you do see a rash, you can think about it in a, a couple categories. It could be mild. So the way that you know that it's mild, you have them open their little mouth and there's no rash in there. So it doesn't involve their mucous membranes or it doesn't involve their genitals. Um, and then you can follow those kids, give them some uh, medications that stop them from itching, and then follow them very closely. A severe reaction is something called Stevens-Johnson. Have you guys ever seen that? Raise the hands. Great. So it looks like uh, it's extremely severe. Um, you know, you can, have involvement, you can have involvement of your mouth, your eyes, any mucosa, your genitals. And sometimes if it's really severe, it looks like they're a burn patient, like their skin is like falling off. It's very bad. Uh, that would be a reason to stop the medication right away. Um, you can also have a hepatitis. Um, who knows what a hepatitis is? Inflammation of the liver. So you check your liver, the, their liver function tests and they're high. That would be uh, another side effect. So that's a picture of a neverapine never rash. Can you guys see that okay? So, kind of tell little bumps. Neverapine rash once again. Okay. How many of you guys have actually seen this in person, like in a patient? Yeah. You've seen that? Okay. A couple of you? Okay. <coughs> All right. Next medication is AZT or Zidavudine. I mean, the big thing about Zidavudine is that it's very hard on the bone marrow. So it's associated with anemia and neutropenia, which is the low white blood cell count. Uh, it occurs in 20 to 40% of symptomatic children. Uh, and that's why it's really important when a child's on the AZT that you check their blood count to make sure that their hemoglobin is okay, that they do not have anemia. Uh, points that you would be uh, worried about is if their hemoglobin drops below 8 or their neutrophils or their white blood cells, particular type of white blood cell count, drops below 400. Um, if it gets really severe, sometimes uh, you might need to transfuse that child, give them a blood transfusion. Their hemoglobin is very low and they're very anemic. And symptomatic. Um, if it gets to that point, sometimes you have to stop the medication or you have to pull back a little bit on the dose, lower it. And once again, these are things that you would probably discuss with the pediatrician. Uh, it's important to mo monitor their full blood count at two, four, eight weeks and then six months, just like uh, with the neverapine. And the nice thing about this medication is that a solution is stable at room air, room air, room temperature. Great. For a month. Uh, okay. DDI. And important things about this, you have to give it on an empty stomach. Uh, so that means one hour before eating or two hours after eating. You need to take at least two tablets so it buffers the acid in your stomach. Uh, and then when you are an older kid or an adult, you can give it once daily. But for the younger kids, you have to do it two times per day. Mm, and uh, you need to refrigerate the suspension. Okay. Side effects, pancreatitis peripheral neuropathy, and lactic acidosis. So these, these side effects look pretty similar to which ones, with the exception of pancreatitis? To stavudine. Great, okay. Next, Kaletra, or also known as Alluvia, which is lupinavir boosted with ritonavir. Uh, it's a great medication, and it's great uh, when we use it in children. Uh, it's actually very difficult to become resistant. 
So what that means basically is that uh, although we don't want this to happen, if a child's not taking all their medications and they're so, so adherent, uh, the medication is what we call like, just very forgiving, that you can get away with it. Uh, with the uh, efavirenz, nevirapine, the medication is not very forgiving. Forgiving. You miss your doses, you will become resistant very quickly. Okay. Uh, it's actually very minimal side effects. I think the big thing that people talk about is GI upset, like being nauseous and those kinds of things. Um, the solution of this medication is stable in room air for a month after you make it. Uh, and you need to remember that you need to dose adjust for patients who have tuberculosis. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So we talked about Kalitra or Aluvia being lapinavir and ritonavir. You can get ritonavir by itself, um, and we'll talk about when you would use that. Uh, but the, uh, the thing with ritonavir are, are the following, that um, you need to give it with food, you need to refrigerate it, and uh, it can cause a lot of nausea. But the big thing is that it tastes really, really bad. I mean, the kids don't want to, they'll spit it right back out. So things to think about, if you have to give the kids some ritonavir, mix it with something, pudding, custard, ice cream, and the kids will like it, it'll mass the taste. Um, give, them something, give them something really cold so they can't, like, you know, an ice cube, have them stuck on that, and then give it to them because that way they won't be able to taste as much. Put peanut butter in their mouth, or give them a treat. Give them some, something really sweet afterwards. Okay. So, ritonavir, nausea and vomiting. <laughs> That's uh, one of the big side effects. Uh, and the other side effects are listed there. Diarrhea, some headache, abdominal pain. Um, circumoral paresthesia, so you get weird sensations around your mouth. Um, your, you might have a hepatitis. Your lipids or your cholesterol might be abnormal. Or it might uh, increase your sugars, hyperglycemia. Questions about those medications? That's a lot to cover. I'd just like to give you guys a general overview about that. Questions about the medications? <laughs> so with Stevens Johnson's can happen with any medication. It can happen if you get recephin. It can happen with a lot of medications. It's a severe allergic reaction. The idea with Stevens Johnson is that it would be indicated to stop the medication or all medications immediately, especially if you don't know what caused it. The problem with Stevens Johnson is that once you already have the rash and the problem, uh, even even when you withdraw the medication, they still have these you know these um, this rash and this mucous membrane involvement. So the thing about Stevens Johnson's patients is that they have to have a lot of a very high care. So because they if it's very severe are like burn patients, uh, they need to be in an intensive care unit. So if uh, patients who have Stephen Johnson's who get um, a lot of care, there's a chance that they might survive. Uh, if it's really severe and they get, you know, infections of their skin and it gets into their blood, a, a good proportion of those patients actually pass away. So, it's, I mean, it's a very severe reaction. I mean, you see that. You think, like, you look inside their mouth or look at their genitals and it's, you know, and there's rash in there. Stop it right away. Okay? Good question. Any, anything else? Okay, let's talk briefly about tuberculosis and HIV co-infection, because that's uh, probably something that you will be coming across. So uh, what do you do if a child presents with tuberculosis and they are already on uh, antiretrovirals or they're going to be starting? So if a child's on Kaletra, you need to double the Kaletra dose, which is what people seem to do, or you need to give them more ritonavir. Okay, because what happens with some of the tuberculosis medications, it metabolizes or chews up the ARVs faster. Um, you process them more quickly. So you need to give them a little bit more of the ritonavir part. So the way that sounds like people are practically doing it is they take the Kaletra dose and just double it. Okay, the other option would be to give some additional ritonavir. But because ritonavir tastes so bad, people I think are a little bit uh, hesitant. It isn't, it's not very easy to do practically. Okay, if the child's on nevirapine and they're under three years of age, you're going to switch them to Kaletra. Okay, if they're older than three years of age and the weight old, uh, greater than 10 kilos, you change them to efavirenz. Okay, so if the child's having a lot of problems being on the tuberculosis treatment and the ARVs, uh, you might think about interrupting the ARVs uh, for a period of time while they're completing the tuberculosis treatment. That would be something I would consult uh someone with a lot of experience uh, about, okay? 
So let's get back to seeing the child to the visit. So then you start, you know, you've seen the kid, assess them, they're candidate for ARVs, you, you, you put them through the readiness assessment, um, you started them on their medication, so when do you see them back? Two weeks is the first time. So what do you do at that visit? Not surprisingly, you're gonna see them, you're gonna examine them, you're gonna see how they're growing. The big thing also important is to do an adherence uh, assessment. So how do you do that? Pill count, you ask the caretaker, how's it going? Um, and then also measuring, because sometimes they're not always pills, right? Some of these kids are on solution medications. Next thing you have to think about, is this kid having any side effects or toxicity from the medications? Um, and sometimes you can tell that by looking at them, you know, they have a rash, um, you might need to draw blood uh, for that, okay? And then you give them medication for two additional weeks. So then two additional weeks later, you're at four weeks. So they've been on medications for four weeks. Not surprisingly, what are you gonna do? You're gonna examine them. And you're gonna get out a weight and a height. You're going to once again ask them about adherence, look for signs of toxicity, um, you know, adjust the medication schedule if needed. And you might need to do some blood work as well and give them medications at this point for four weeks time. So at this point, you're two months or eight weeks into ARVs. Very similar. Examine them, check for adherence, look for side effects or toxicity. Um, might think about doing some blood work and then give them medication for an additional four weeks, an additional month. So at this point, you're three months into it. And then, uh, so you're gonna do the same as before. You're gonna give them monthly refills. And then at each visit, ask them, you know, do you have any leftover medications? That might give you a sense of adherence. You know, they have a lot of leftover medications. They're probably not taking them, right? Um, and then also looking at the volumes. So you're at three, three months at this point. At this point, you would see the child every three months, okay? Questions about that? So we talked about two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, and then every three months. You probably would bring them back more often and, you know, uh, have other people help, like the social workers, the counselors, help them uh, do that. But th that might be a reason to bring them back instead of every month, ask them to come back every two weeks. You just might bring them back and, you know, really try to help them and encourage them. Mm -hmm. It would be important. Okay, so uh, going back to... Uh, the tuberculosis and HIV co-infection. A question that comes up is, how long do you have to wait before you can start ARVs in a patient, a child with tuberculosis? So it really depends uh, how sick they are and uh, how severe uh, their immune suppression is. So if you are clinical stage four, so you guys remember what some of those were? You guys wanna call it a few, what, what, what would be a stage four? Carpal sarcoma, okay, what else? Uh, diarrhea for how long? Two weeks. Two weeks or more, great. What else is stage four? Ah! <laughs> Loud and proud. Resistant TB, okay, what else? Or any TB? Wasting, severe wasting, great. So you guys get the idea. So there's stage four. It doesn't matter what their immune system is doing. You know, you'd be very worried about this child. So you would wait two weeks before starting ARVs. So two weeks of tuberculosis medication, then you start ARVs at a two week mark, okay? Sometimes, these are the recommendations. Sometimes if the child is really sick, sometimes you don't have two weeks, but that would be something you would consult a physician with, okay? If you're a stage three, then you would look at where you fall. Are you severely immunosuppressed? Are you have advanced immunosuppression, mild or not? and you would decide based on that when to start. So um, if you have mild or not significant immune, uh, immune suppression, you would start within the first two months. So you have tuberculosis treatment for two months, then you start ARVs, okay? It's important to keep a close eye, close eye on these kids because they might look okay one minute, and then a month later, you know, you might not have two months. You know, you might wanna bring them back in the interim to make sure they haven't gotten sick. Okay, so then how do you monitor for side effects? Like how often do you check labs, right? Everyone's like, you know, drawing blood on a baby or on a child is always a pain. It's always, you know, the poor little child. It's important, it's super important to draw blood on a, on a child, especially when it's indicated. So when is it indicated? 
It depends really on the medications that they're on because they have different side effects like we talked about. So if they are nevirapine, you worry about liver, liver abnormality, so the ALT, uh, you want to check it at this interval, okay? AZT, it's hard on the bone marrow, right? So you want to get a full blood count at that interval. And then all the other ones, irrespective of what you're doing, you want to get a CD4 count in a viral load six months. So at the beginning, six months, uh, first year, et cetera. And then after that, every year. Okay? So let's talk about monitoring in general. So what are the components of monitoring? At each, each visit, you should be asking, how are they doing clinically? How are they doing immunologically? And what do I mean by immunologically? So what, what does that mean checking? CD4 count. CD4 count, viral load, great. Uh, well, actually, CD4 count. What does it mean to have a virologic response? So what happens to your viral load if you're on ARVs? Great, it should be dropping, and it drops actually pretty quickly. And what do you want it to get to? Undetectable, great. Um, you want to check for toxicity. So once again, think about what medications are they on? What are the most common side effects? Does this child have that side effect? Adherence always important. And once again, like I said, disclosure is always important as well. So the other thing is that children grow, and they grow very quickly, especially in the first few years of life. So you might ask, you know, how often should I be weight adjusting their medications? So you should be changing the dose of their medication when their weight has changed by 10%. Okay? So if they go from 30 kilos to, I don't know, like 34 kilos, that's about 10%, I think. So you would think about uh, weight adjusting. Okay? You want to check that every time you see them. Check their weight and make sure you don't have to go up on their uh, doses. And there's these very nice dosing cards that help you. What is, you know, what is the weight of the child and how much medication do I have to give them? It's too small to read, but I think most clinics have these dosing sheets for children. All right, uh, so other things to remember is that if the child's on uh, nevirapine, at the first two weeks, do you guys remember how often we give it? Great, once, once daily. At two weeks, it goes to twice daily. So you need to make sure that change is made. And then you need to make sure that uh, if someone follows up on the full blood count and the liver function test that were collected at a two-week visit to make sure you're not missing any anemia secondary to your AZT if the child's on that or any li liver toxicity from the nevirapine. Okay? So what constitutes success? So once again, you can think about big categories. Clinically, the child needs to be growing and developing really well. You want to make sure the child isn't having any opportunistic infections. Um, and you want to make sure they're not having any side effects from, from their uh, medication. From a laboratory standpoint, uh, you want to make sure that their viral load is undetectable by six months. Okay, that's something uh, really important to strive for. And if that's not happening, you have to ask yourself, is it a problem with adherence? Is it a problem with not, us not giving enough medications? Is it a problem with us giving the wrong medications? Is child resistant for some reason? Okay. Uh, you want to make sure that their CD4 count is uptrending, going up from their baseline. You want to make sure there's no liver toxicity or anemia. Uh, and you want to avoid drug resistance. So how do you avoid drug resistance? Adherence number one, two, and three. What else? From our standpoint, we want to make sure we're giving them the right dose of medication, right? If the child grew too fast and, like, they're on half the dose they're supposed to be, it's kind of our fault, right? Their, their numbers don't look right because we didn't give enough medicine. Uh, and you want to always ask yourself, is there resistance, okay? Because that's something that down the line you might worry about. So adherence, adherence, adherence. You guys have heard that. And then uh, working towards full disclosure. So uh, helping the parents and the caregivers get to the point that they feel comfortable telling the child when they're old enough to developmentally understand. So uh, things to take away. There are multiple ways of treating children uh, with HIV uh, quite effectively. Um, and sure, it sounds like as you guys took away, there's a lot of specifics uh, in pediatric HIV care that are different than adult care. Uh, but we have the tools um, to uh, help children remain healthy and live actually pretty long lives. Okay, questions? Concerns? Great. What, what, what's the life expectancy related to an uh, HIV positive child? Uh, in the United States, uh, like in the, the here, here in South Africa, I don't know if those numbers exist. Nobody knows because 
Sarah Gerard, Sarah Gazzani been giving the children since 2004? But in the United States, which is like we have a pretty long track record, so the children who uh, were infected as babies are right now uh, late 20s.